Hi, welcome to Gord's Poetry Show, July 5, 2015. For those of you who may be retroviewing from uh, October of 2023, just to uh, keep your timelines in order, it is in fact July 5, 2015. And um, this is poetry show number, I don't know, 36, 37, 35 can't quite remember and um, but I'm sure the uh, issue will get sorted out as we put up the titles later so lots to get through today or I think it's lots so um, I better start with some uh, good red wine Hmm. Mild and smooth. Recently, The New Yorker, uh, featuring the writer Dan Chiasson, did, um, well, Dan wrote it, New Yorker published it. Nice little uh, review of, uh, review essay of John Ashbery's latest book of poems. Quite insightful, I thought. Don't normally read criticism, but, um, as John Ashbery is, in my mind, the most influential poet in English writing in the last, oh, at least 30 years. I would say most, of, well, several of the poets we'll be reading later today, and I have quite a few to get through, not all of them, have been profoundly influenced, as almost everyone has, um, by his language and his language structures and the um, unusually eccentric <laughs> phrase combinations that he chooses to use. Anyway, here we go. John Ashbery's latest book of poems is 26th, not counting various compilations and reissues, is Breezeway. As with most of Ashbery's work, its medium is composed partly of language foraged from everyday American speech. Foraged. The effect is sometimes unnerving as though someone had given you your own garbage back as a gift, cheerfully wrapped. Ashbury is nearly 88. More than ever, his style is a net for the weirdest linguistic flotsam. Few others of his generation would think to put, quote, lemon telenovela or Texas burger in a poem or write these lines. Thanks to a snakeskin toupee, my grayish push boots, Exhale new patina, prestige. Exunt the Kardashians. He has gone farther from literature within literature than any poet alive. His game is to make an intentionally frivolous style express the full range of human feeling, and he remains funnier and better at it, a game he invented than many of his imitators. It's common for people to prefer a prior Ashbury, well, I could say the same about Pink Floyd, although few can agree on which one. There is no compliant. There is the non-compliant poet of the Tennis Court Oath, his 1962 book. Catch that, 1962. Giddy in his divines of meaning, the poet of childhood and its longers, whom we encounter in his 739-line poem, The Skaters, 66. The sublime meditative poet of self-portrait in a convex mirror, 75. The elegist of your name here, 2000. But for years now, Ashbury has been writing poems like those in Breezeway. Short lyrics that begin anywhere and end with a shrug, formed with, from a bricolage of pop cultural trivia and cliché. That's it in a nutshell. Wonderful. They aren't closed works, as he has put it. They are lengths of consciousness that he will snip off at random intervals, like licorice cut from a spool. Quote. Someone said we needed a breezeway to bark down remnants of Superstorm Elias jugularly. Alas, it wasn't my call. I didn't have a call or anything resembling one. You see, I have always been a rather dull-spirited winch. End quote. 
The style works partly by taking phrases whose contours already exist in the mind, quotes remnants of Superstorm Elias, for example, and substituting near misses. The verb to bark down is almost to back down or to break down, which I suppose you might do when hit with a storm's debris. The meaningless adverb jugularly might be jocularly or muscularly, misheard through the storm's strong winds. You'd rather have a winch than a wench in a storm. The context implies the former, the tone the latter. These poems conjure up a massive mental errata slip made up of what they almost say and nearly mean. Ashbury's style prizes such mistakes and misapprehensions as though looking for the word on the tip of the tongue. William James described consciousness as the alternation of flights and perchings, mm -hmm. suggesting that we tend to overvalue perchings the nouns are the primary verbs in a sentence that steal the spotlight from the little words like in and but or and of. It was James, a profound influence on Ashbury, who coined the term stream of consciousness and who insisted on what he called a, quote, reinstatement of the vague and inarticulate to its proper place in our mental life, end quote. James's flights and in-between zones find in breezeway a breezeway, a structure between structures, a place to rest that is not a resting place, a long Q&A period before the big event is adjourned, a period marked as in the title of one poem by, the, by deliberate Andante and Filibuster. Well, I hope that was uh, deeply meaningful to you. I found it quite uh, succinct and accurate. And, you know, but then I'm a huge Jasper-y sort of, what's the word? Excavator. Got some of his books right by my bed. I read them quite regularly. No. Recent poetry by mostly Canadians, some Americans. Liz Howard, Canadian, Infinite Citizen of the Shaking Tent is her new book, 2015 from McLeod and Stewart, part of that huge publishing umbrella, penguinrandomhouse.ca. Standard Time, Liz Howard. The total psychic economy shimmers. A latent mouthpiece of maple out in the field anthropologically. This voice in its hollow. All night the blood moon measures the dilation of your pupil. Pinprick or dinner plate in this plenum where our attention fails to die. A positive outcome. Music in the unfinished basement. A purple curfew for causation that apply a sinuous window of dried moths over the harbour. Exercise and temperament pitched back over the clouded bathroom mirror, transiting near to silver, almost female in a song of Velcro afterbirth and gravel. In our settler dreams, plexiglass teeth were stuck in the hide of the ravine, a freeway of copper wire and sugar bush metabolics. Copernican limbs, mercury in the water, little silver pills tracing a path through the lake bed of submerged logs to a trap of currents under rock. All are old love and petrochemicals, not otherwise specified. Yes, excellent syntax and. <laughs> Wonderful, Les, wonderful stuff. Uh, if I didn't know more to read, I'd read more, he said enigmatically. Um, a lady with a Dutch name that I may mispronounce. Sadiqua de Meijer. Born in uh, Amsterdam, came to Toronto. Her new book, Leaving Howe Island, published by Ulican Books, Quite recently, if not indeed this year. Let me see. Yeah, looks like, oh, no, 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 I'm wrong. 2013, a couple of years old. Our Lady of Grace. A 
I volunteered because I'd seen a burned and orphaned boy on the news over my plate of noodles. Comforting him seemed imperative, impossible, so I convinced myself that need is need, and maybe someone in the dark glass levels of the grace was as alone. The uniform was a green shirt dress and suited my fellow volunteers, brisk women whose lipstick glared in their locker mirrors. I was much taller, and the hemline that fell to their knees bisected my nylon thighs. They could make deer sound sharp. There was a vacancy in ultrasound. I had to fill the plastic squeeze bottles with gel and circling the waiting room, urging patients to hold their urine. When I'd proved capable, they had me answer the phone over breaks. I liked proceeding from the heading on the yellow message pad. While you were out. There was a rumor that the Grace was testing a robotic porter. They said it could sense obstacles by sonar like a bat. One afternoon in the cooked linen smell of the corridor, it rolled alongside me like R2-D2 welded to a dumb waiter and lit the elevator button without touch. Other things I had tried were marches and canvassing and once on the sidewalk next to a gas station, I held a sheet of Bristol board that said, how many lives per gallon in red paint, which wasn't metric, but sounded better. Those years are half blank to me now. What was taught in school or how old my parents look. But I remember standing beside the robot in front of the elevator doors, waiting and waiting for an acknowledgement of me, the hesitant human shaped obstacle. Some signal of lights or beeps. <laughs> and we had a little stall there. Mm, computers, computers. That last line was, in case it got missed, some signal of lights or beeps. Sadiqa. Or Sadiqa. I'm not sure. Um, thank you, thank you. Leaving Howe Island is the title of that book. Now a well-known, very well-known, award-winning Canadian poet Lorna Crozier and her recent, if not very new book, The Wrong Cat. How can cats be wrong? You ask yourself. Or maybe it was the wrong cat in the box or the wrong cat on the street or who knows. I have picked a poem called Heart Sutra or the poem picked me if you uh, wish to um, assign sentience to poetry, which um, I think a lot of us do. Um, evidence or no evidence, purely anecdotal, uh, as is all poetry. The anecdotes of the heart, shall we say, spanning through time towards eternity. Mm -hmm. Heart Sutra. Lorna. The bullet burned through his heart, but did not kill him. He had no heart, the host said. What should have turned him into merely meat and bones shot through the emptiness inside? Then what pumped his blood, she asked. She and her husband guests for the night at the summer cabin two hours from town. His hate, his rage, their friend replied. Whatever the truth of it, in the Reuters photos he'd passed across the table, she could see the healed over hole on his chest, like a thumbprint pressed into dough, and in another, the exit wound that pouted below his left shoulder blade. The hostess, who'd spent hours stirring at the stove so she could serve the perfect risotto, said, the scars make him more attractive, as if, as if they were chatting about a bad boy movie star, not a soldier on trial for rape as if he'd find redemption in the arms of a woman who could cook. The guest hated what, what began to burn inside her, a loathing for the friends who'd invited them to stay the night and some shameful dark longing for this terrible stranger and his phantom heart. She tried to think ahead, no, she tried to think instead of the cicatrix that slashed diagonally across her husband's breasts, just missing the nipple that was more sensitive than hers. Her teeth could tell you. 
A knife cut, he said when they first met, got it in a bar. Years later, he confessed as a kid, he'd smashed into a barbed wire fence. It was winter, snow climbed halfway up the posts. The blood that shocked him into stillness leapt from the gash, caught on the barbs and hardened into ice. Now, she swears, every time they fuck, she melts one red beet, then another in her mouth. Go, 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 she whispers, go beyond, go thoroughly beyond the heart sutra preceded by the Dalai Lama, a ghost pulse on her tongue. Nice one, Loria. Like that. And uh, it was the Dalai Lama's 80th birthday just the other day, and um, he got many cheers and songs at uh, Glastonbury. Of course, if you're watching in 2023, that's all ancient history. But he might still be alive by then. He's a healthy old fella. Right. Um, Maya Anderson, light takes. Light takes. Oh, I like the pun on that. Very good. Published by Cormorant, 2014. And um, there's some interesting stuff here. Um, I think it's um, this lady poet, this <clears throat> poet, uh, sorry, the, I know that poetess stuff doesn't, doesn't go down well these days, lives in Quebec City. She was for many years an actor, then a shepherd and a grower, then an Anglican priest. Um, all of which is interesting and all of which is relevant to um, her repeated discussions of, shall we say, uh, the deity, a deity, deity in divinity. Although maybe that's me, I prefer divinity, she prefers deities. I don't like to personalize divinity. Putting a form on it to me is, is um, limiting, you know, as forms are. But um, she writes fine poems. And here's one of them. God never asks you. God never asks you what's wrong. He never comes up behind you and puts a gentle hand on your shoulder and looks into your eyes with concern, with tenderness, with a lover's tenderness. He never does that. He doesn't tell you where to find a doctor in a land of no doctors. He doesn't rise to the occasion of your dismay at the intelligible disorder of your outward and visible signage when all you want is inward grace. A place for everything and everything in its place, as your grandmothers would have said. Grace, that inward commodity. God is like a husband that way. What more could you want? Only God knows what his silence is up to. It's just that we don't. Nor does the husband know what his own silence owns up to. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> another one, the door of heaven. The door of heaven slammed shut against the lot of us. Someone said it was closed for all time. But the Holy One, not content with the arithmetic of it, issued forth in that way of his, the way of all spirit, and appointed a bricoleur to jimmy the code of the lock. The lock, of course, had been put on by us. We would not pass through the door. We preferred instead the sense of drama belonging to cut to the chase videos with seconds to go before the catastrophe. Easy of access holds no plot. Tension is the rule we live by. Crisis or default mode. So the bricoleur gave us crisis, and the door of heaven swung open. In the Solomon Islands, Quebec, Rome, the Levant, such a clamor of expectation. The door will swing shut again. Surely, surely, the door will shut again. Urgency in the air. Well, what was the code the bricoleur put in? Did he say? Did he follow orders? It looks to me as if the door stands open. What do you think? Mia Anderson, Light Takes, Cormorant's books. That's some um, Canadian for you Americans. Oh yes, and here we have um, Ken Babstock's new book, On Malice. We've read from Ken before, challenging poet that he is. A challenging poet and, um, uh, how shall I put it, um, an editor who seems to be all over the place, helping people edit their books. And doing a fine job at that also. On Malice, Ken Babstock, Coach House Books, Toronto, 2014. Now, um, these poems do seem to be in a very long 
sequence. And uh, mysterious and enigmatic as they are, I'm going to read two of them just to show you how um, undulatingly clever they are. Um, you'll really need to get the whole book. It's, um, it's, it's out there, let me tell you. Ken's often out there and, you know, he doesn't give a shit whether you care whether he's out there or not. He's out there. And guess what? He's staying. And if you don't like it, too bad. I don't mind it myself. It's some, um, it's a uh, uh, mysterious territory and I like wandering there. When a stranger comes along ill with a dirty foot, perhaps running the card back again, will get you more water, a lump of sugar. I can only read out what we get back. I want to travel home already. The darker band between the stars, the chewed console, the boar's shadow spanning the fence gap. Does the bandit still watch you every day in the controlled city? When I smell that mind, I want home. So that's from a section called SIGINT, Signals Intelligence. You know. And a little note below says, West of Skitivgar, June 26, 1986, light aircraft. Sounds like Scandinavia to me. And the next one is um, June 30th, 1988, 8.40, after taking off Samara, multiple incidents. A middle-sized giant came along who wanted to thump me. The birds ranted a lot. The boys invited morning to be a fixed ladder, not the big one. I must climb over it, sadly, but I do want to have you, for he seems to conceive the slightest contact as license to think down in. I hit it with a maul. That's M-A-U-L. Or I slept under a desk, dreaming the forest's elbows were salmon and the ice thawed. Because you involved me. Ah, Pamela Porter, House Made of Rain. I'm looking at this book of Ray, late 2014. Did not know Pamela Porter before. She is a Governor General's Award winner. That's a big deal here in Canada. And um, I just, I do love her rolling lyricism. I must say, Pamela, very, very nice. How did I manage to miss you before? You seem to have uh, several books in the past. And oh my God, right back to, well, I want to, about 10 books before. This one's from Ronsdale Press. They're all quite lovely. It was a, they're very hard to choose. First world. We were born into birds, into bone, into wings, mist drifting among the pines, and gathered to ourselves plenty for this life. Loneliness to rival the sky, perfection in the art of losing. I had my own darkness, my face a new moon, and planned my journey by the constellations, marked them in ink on my palm and carried with me an empty basket, and went on each day being born into a second world and a third, a bright music calling my name beyond all waters. I knew my ancestry, a tree fallen onto a house, horses foraging the hopeless grass, a map torn along its folds, a violin missing from the case. Not everything is held in the hands of the living. There are winters I've only dreamed about. Who would find us in our wilderness, singing a song poured out of the wind's sleep? I opened the book of lost words, and by lamplight read one of one who died one morning, but who also rose to walk beneath the lintel, bearing petals in his palms. The story is true. A soul does not need to explain itself. While the world turned toward the light, wind lifted the petals from his hands. A cloud of wings, a sudden hundred sudden flames. Soul. A 
Across the chasm of flown things we arrive together, early in our future. She a house of light, a lamp which could not be dimmed. Phosphorescent. In childhood she thought the trees a ladder to heaven, and pushed us higher, higher. While I slept she'd hear God walking above us. That's the furnace, I told her. She pointed to the moon, lit and round. Surely it was home, until I opened my school book and pointed to the page. She tried to dig her way back with a spoon, made me hold out my palms grimy with dirt, studied them like a map. There was the problem of the lost father. She could not give me his name or face, and the men and boys who pinned me down, and wars within the house, and wars without. Together we whispered of death and how to achieve it, by water, by blood. One day she said to me with the imperative of a parent, write this, write this down. With her, this journey has been long. More from that one, I suspect. Thank you, Pamela. We're whizzing right along here. <clears throat> Lawrence Hutchman, selected poems from Guernica. Lawrence has written, hmm, well, this is way back in 2007. I'm not quite sure how this managed to sort of surface recently. Um, books have a way of bubbling up here at Poetry Show. You know, sort of like, then suddenly they're on the surface and I go, oh, look at that. Um, so from uh, an early, six earlier books uh, selected in this one, Mozart in the Supermarkets from Explorations, 1975. Here are the superabundance of food, chocolate ants from Africa, bananas from South America, a thousand oranges from California. We wind our way among the sections, the music reeling around our heads. We are confronted with richness, yet the subtle emptiness everywhere an extension of rawly cut cows, canned goods, disengaged fruits. There is so little courage here, standing before the clanging registers, the shopping carts filled with packages, a language of refrigerated scholars, loud newscasters between commercials, a language everyone consumes but few digest. The centre of the world is everywhere, and when I hold these goods, the music returns. The moment's sudden, clear harmony. Star of Venus in the Blue Dawn. Midnight from Foreign National, 1993. My favorite hour. How comfortable to sit here, listening to the refrigerator humming, the syncopation of the clock, the midnight bus breaking, the warming up of an orchestra. After a long day's journey, I reach the shore and look out on sleep's dark breakers. Today we painted a wall, not much, mind you, but those old green flowers are finally gone. We can hang pictures there. Get back to midnight. Not on the beach, but the wide red table that spreads before me like a mesa. In the landscape are walnuts. Green grapes, Spider-Man, wooden Russian dolls. My thought stops. I step outside myself. I am the stranger walking by the sea. Midnight, my favorite hour, when the refrigerator is an Arctic piano. Hmm. After the hockey game last night, I drove out into the unrecognizable Mauve City. On the mountain's edge, the boy and girl drank, danced, and sang into the wind. On the edge, be near the power, not the guardian of thought. Be the stranger, the reader. Come, the scherzo is over. Already the drum of the clock is fading and the piano plays softly like a cardiogram. Listen, the late night bus revelers, the voices of sleep. The clock steps draw you closer to the waves. Fatigue like a friend takes you into the weird night childhood. Now after traveling all day, relearn the world. 
Stranger, the sea is here. Forget and welcome. My goodness, we seem to be going again. Um, we had uh, <laughs> some kind of a stop there. I'm not quite sure what happened, but something happened. So if there was a gap a few moments ago, I'm sorry. Looks like we're uh, continuing on. So, VJ Sesshardi, winner of the Pulitzer Prize. Um, when? I'm not quite sure, but he, he won it fairly recently, maybe this past year. Grey Wolf Press, 2013. Well, no, no, past year, some years ago. But um, a fine poet indeed, and I'd never heard of him before, but, you know, how many times have I said that? Script meeting. So here's this guy. What is he, 40, 50? He has a condition, a history, ex-urban, depressed, but alert. His senses are sharp. He hears the little hiccups embedded in the pattern of sound. Sleepwalking in the woods. Premonitions of cataclysms. Flashbacks to black ops. All of which you do a nice job of establishing under the opening credits. Dimple, we might say. The emptiness of his days. And then, next, cue the family memories. The accident on I-5. The 18-wheeler. Rain. Fog. A doe the lake, the stalled out board motor, the rogue wave, the explosion in the warehouse, which is very good. Something needs to be blown up right about here. But we have to know what actually happens sooner late than later. Remember, our reputation as a studio is built not on suspense, but on horror. We like the genetically engineered second wife and son, the zombie in the basement, not so much. Only a little bit less tedious than his guilt-soaked diary entries in a fine copper plate hand are the drooling flashes of nobility interspersing his psychotic episodes. You have his eyeballs twitching out of their sockets right here. And how many times have we seen that before? How many times have we left the multiplex disappointed, convinced our needs will never be satisfied by the world's mimetic gestures? Don't leave us feeling like that. Stick with your guy. He's his own zombie. He haunts his own nights. Not in this life will he tear himself from the bank of the burning river, hot-footing it onto the radiating marl, as his arrow of longing seeks the other shore. Not in this life or the next. Show us what that means to him and what he means to it. As our master said so long ago in the London drawing room, brilliant with candelabras, quote, here let us linger as the coal-fired Victorian ambience curses outside. Never forget that both in art and that which art comprehends, the whom you create is the key. It is to the whom you create that the what 
after all so trivial, so adventitious, upon examination, will, or as likely will not, happen. The rest we can manage digitally. <laughs> oh, that's, the whole book's very good, actually. I'm sorry I can't read more, but we'll get back to another time. And, so, ooh, 35 minutes. Oh, my God, you must have all clicked off by now. Finally, um, Dylan. The inimitable Dylan, the eternal Dylan, the Dylan we can never forget, because he was so darn good. Collected Poems, 1952, that uh, little indicator there. The Sight of the Truth. The sight of the truth you may not see, my son, king of your blue eyes in the blinding country of youth, that all is undone under the unminding skies of innocence and guilt. Before you move to make one gesture of the heart or head, is gathered and spilt into the winding dark like the dust of the dead. Good and bad, two ways of moving about your death by the grinding sea. King of your heart in the blind days, blown away like breath, go crying through you and me and in the souls of men, of all men, into the innocent dark, the guilty dark, and good death and bad death, and then in the last element fly like the star's blood, like the sun's tears, like the moon's seed, rubbish and fire, the flying rant of the sky, king of your six years, and the wicked wish down the beginning of plants and animals and birds, water and light, the earth and sky is cast before you move. And each lie, die in unjudging love. Did we get a pause there too? Oh God, I hope not. Love in the Asylum. I think we know who this is for. A stranger has come to share my room in the house, not right in the head, a girl mad as birds, bolting the night of the door with her arm, her plume. Straight in the mazed bed, she deludes the heaven-proof house with entering clouds, yet she deludes with walking this nightmarish room at large as the dead, or rides the imagined oceans of the male wards. She has come possessed, who admits the delusive light through the bouncing wall. Possessed by skies, she sleeps in the narrow trough, but she walks the dust, yet raves at her will on the madhouse boards, worn thin by my walking tears. And taken by light in her arms at long and dear last, I may without fail suffer the first vision that set fire to the stars. Well... 37 minutes, almost 38. My God, the longest poetry show yet. Probably all filled with little glitches and problems, but, um, you know, that's life. That's life on the computer. So um, let me see what happens next. Are we moving? <laughs> Okay, let's stop. Bye-bye. So long. Farewell.